can be found. <laughs> now, team. And that then means that next lecture Because we've got Peter Inskip here to talk to take us into the 18th century. We've been quite a lot in the 19th, but now we're going to the 18th. As you can see from your program, he is a consultant for Stowe Landscape Gardens, also on the committee of the HLF and the HHA for historic buildings, and so is one of the authorities on our park buildings. And Stowe contains probably more of them than anywhere else. And so you'll give us an introduction to this great theme. Thank you. Thank you, uh, We return to convention slides and uh, microphones. Um, and those hideous benches that Stuart was talking about, all those <laughs> monstrous things. Um, anyway, uh, I, I'm down to talk about 18th century garden buildings. I want to talk about one that, of course, is at Stowe, and of course, it's the Temple of Concord. Um, but uh, I was more concerned about the title of the conference than the title of the lecture. Um, conjectural detailing um, is obviously a horticultural <coughs> term. It's almost an adjective of derision um, in the architectural world. And I hope that we try to do everything to avoid conjectural detailing in, in the approach to buildings. Stowe. Um, as Ted said, is, is littered with great historic buildings uh, in the garden. I mean, the, the greatest monument is, of course, the house. And then we've got 35 temples dotted around through 350 acres of garden. Uh, it's the site of innovation. Uh, the first major Gothic temple, by, which is by James Gibbs. And then also probably the first Chinese house. Um, this is a photograph of it when it was in Ireland. Uh, it has come back to Stowe, uh, but is sited on a different location than its original one because the garden has so changed. Um, whether it should be at Stowe is another matter. It was much better at Wooden. But in this idea of it being a site of innovation, we have the Temple of Concord as the first great neoclassical temple in this country, <coughs> if not in, 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 in Europe. And then the house continues this idea of innovation, and Thomas Pitt and Valdre's alterations to the house in the 1770s anticipates Soane's miraculous spatial planning of, of um, great schemes like the House of Lords, and Soane was very much um, indebted to Thomas Pitt and also was working at Stowe in the early 1800s. Uh, it is also a site of tremendous influence. Um, Count Nilov was sent by Catherine the Great when she was laying out the Sake Cielo, and um, he came to Stowe, saw the, the uh, Palladium Bridge, and translated the English limestone into Russian grey marble um, following his visit. He also lifted Vanbrugh's um, pyramid, and um, the rostral column. So when you go around the great, great Russian garden, you actually sort of have a tremendous jolt at seeing these parts of Stowe there. Um, the translation, however, I think is very interesting of seeing what it's like in a different, what one building is like in a different material um, and how, how that changes. Um, and it is also a site that is tremendously well documented. And so, what I was wanting to talk about today is this idea of the conference being called Getting It Right, and it's an architect's approach to uh, repairing these buildings. And the very first thing, of course, to do is to understand the site. And in the documentation, we have a wonderful record uh, in these uh, views by Rigo uh, of the Bridgman Garden, published in 1738 by Bridgman's widow, uh, and, sh and shown on the um, le left-hand screen. Um, by 1800, the whole of the garden had changed into a great picturesque landscape, and so uh, Jean-Claude Nats 
is illustrating virtually the same view, the view from the Temple of Venus looking back across the, the to the house and um, Vanbrugh's rotundo, we see the rotundo there and also here in the house beyond. Um, it's virtually the same view but a completely different landscape. And obviously the understanding of the development of the landscape and the, the development of the character areas in it um, is tremendously important because it was a landscape not only the one that changed but was extended with the Bridgman Vanbrugh landscape to the west side of the house and then um, Kent has the Elysian Fields in the 1730s, Gibbs beyond that Hawkwell Field and then Caperley Brown brings in a, a, an area of land to the north. And this gradual sort of extension throughout the whole of the 18th century is coupled with remodeling of those areas. And there's uh, what does seem important, and going back to what Stuart also was saying earlier, um, what does seem important is acknowledging all those periods and that there's an aesthetic um, uh, continuation of the development of the design throughout the 18th century. In the 19th century, um, the fam family ran out of money and hardly anything of any interest happens and only things trying to save money happen. And it's such a great garden that in a way our philosophy has been to take it back to the significant um, last aesthetic decision for each of the character areas. Um, we also have a very good series of 18th century guidebooks which were published about every other year from from um, the, the late 1740s by a local bookseller in Buckingham called Bickham. And they record the views the, of, of the buildings as they stood about that time. And the good thing is that you can then foresee James Gibbs's Ladies' Temple and how that was later translated by, uh, from transformed by Thomas Pitt in the 1770s to become the Queen's Temple to celebrate the nursing back to health of King George. And that does provide a very, very important record. Uh, what's interesting about the site, however, is we have no architectural drawings at all. We've just got topographical views. And our next set of important documentation is, um, uh, is historic photographs. Uh, the great country life photographs are tremendously important because they come on 12 by 10 plates. You can enlarge them. You can see the state of the stonework in 1900 and, um, and also of the garden. This view from the Temple of Concord shows the view out up the Ladies Diagonal, which by the 1990s had been completely lost and obliterated. Um, and the, our final set of information is the um, very extensive family papers that are in the Huntington Library in Pasadena, um, which we've been researching now for the last um, number of years. It started on Stowe in 1987, um, which only seems the other day, but was referred to earlier in one of the other speakers as being a very long time ago. Um, uh, but it's meant that we've had this terrible drawback each autumn of having to trudge out to California um, and do a fortnight's research in the library there. Um, <laughs> And it's one of those problems, being an architect working on these jobs, yeah. Uh, what has come out of that is that it's a site of change. Um, the house changes from um, a fairly, sort of, well, it's pretty large um, house of the 1680s, um, to which a, 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 a formal garden is added, and then Flitcroft and Gibbs and Vambra extend that house but by the 1770s, it was such a muddle that um, Robert Adam was called in to do a scheme. Um, unfortunately, Lord Temple, I think, I mean, was an amateur architect himself. Um, he, want, he fell out with Adam and got Thomas Pitt to implement most of Adam's scheme, but with some variation. And that is the scheme that we see in uh, the Medlin view at the end of the 18th century. And that same idea of change comes through in the garden with uh, Bridgman's parterre uh, on the south side of the house with Lord and Lady Cobham sitting, sitting there looking down onto the parterre uh, surrounded by um, architectural yew hedges containing 
um, gilded, um, gilded urns and lead urns and uh, statues by Van Ost of the Muses, and beyond that, a view down the Bili Walk to um, a, a fountain uh, at the far end by Vanbra. The whole of that was um, swept away in 1763 uh, by uh, Lord Temple, who had succeeded his uncle in the 1750s. And Temple saw it, saw the creation of that landscape and that prospect from the south leisure of the house as his greatest work at Stowe. The Corinthian Arch uh, is 1763 and was built um, on the, the far distance. The Corinthian Arch on the bridge when drawing is right up there. Um, and is built um, in a way as a tryout of what is going to happen on the house. And then to open up the view, the two uh, lakeside pavilions by Vanbra, these two buildings uh, were demolished. They were closer together here and here, um, forming an entrance into the park. They were demolished, taken down, and rebuilt further apart to give them, uh, to give a proper entrance, to uh, a proper vista from the house. Um, Vanbra's fountain was removed from the lake um, there, and then coming back this way, and the lake was um, made much more informal from an octagon, but when it was being dredged a few years ago, it was very good that you could still see the octagonal form when the water was lowered. And then the parterre had been removed in the 1750s, but the final remnants were taken away. Now, the problem with that great change, and it is the most fantastic thing, and now that the house is being um, repaired by the HLF, all of everything I'm talking about is before the HLF the funding. It's going on now, but it's, we're funded independently, private money um, and English Heritage Grants. Uh, but the HLF has come to the rescue of, the, of Stowe House, which is Stowe School, and the idea of that is that you will now be able to enter through Stowe House and come out to the South Loja, and then you have this tremendous view, and then come down the great steps to the area of where the parterre was. Um, so that's the way you should enter the gardens. Um, but what, what I was saying, uh, the problem on widening that, better just get back, um, was that by widening it, you suddenly landed up with um, the old, an old statue like this one. Uh, no, it's not it's that one, that one. Um, uh, was in the way. It was suddenly in the middle of this great open vista. And so that had to be recited. And in 350 acres of garden, uh, the only position that one could think of reciting Vanbrugh's tetrapylon with Ricebreck statue of Queen Caroline uh, was already occupied by a temple by James Gibbs. So the temple by James Gibbs was taken down on the west side of the garden and was removed to the east side of the garden and the Vanbra one went across. So it's a very complicated story of moving buildings. Um, but you can work it all out from the building accounts um, because of the costs shown in those accounts, like the one I showed earlier. Um, the costs differentiate between reused stone and new stone, and you can see that, that um, the, 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 most of this one um, is being reconstructed from from existing um, stonework. Um, so it's a, a garden that is always moving and changing around, and there's one letter um, from Lord Temple to his sister saying that they've just moved another temple in the garden, and if only it was as easy to move temples as it is to move pictures in your house. Um, the other thing that comes out of looking and understanding the site is the importance of iconography in the gardens um, and the underlying political uh, background and, of, of this great big garden. Um, there's also, uh, the most of the sculpture was um, sold first in 1848, in a sale in 1848, and then another in 1921. But fortunately, most of it has gone to gardens where it still remains. So there's a great collection at um, St. Paul's Warden Berry in Hertfordshire, where um, uh, Lord Glam's bought in the 1848 sale, and um, at Cottesbrook um, in Northamptonshire, uh, which is uh, where the McDonald Buchanan's have the statues 
um, from um, um, ancient virtue, these, these shoemaker statues. Um, the, the statues are all in listed gardens of their own right. They can't, can't be got back, and uh, we could never afford to get them back. But owners have been very generous in allowing copies, um, except for the Victoria and Albert Museum, who say it would damage the sculpture. Um, but uh, they've allowed copies and casts of them, and the reinstatement of the statues into the temple, into Kent's Temple of Ancient Virtue, transformed the whole building, because it suddenly, those blank niches were suddenly decorated by these sculptures. It gave meaning. It revealed the iconography again, and it also re-established the relationship between ancient virtue, the Temple of Ancient Virtue, and the Temple of uh, British Worthies, down, which is sited across the water, down at a lower level than the, the ancient virtue. And um, there's a very nice hierarchy is revealed. Uh, the ancients um, are set within a temple. They're full-size statues, and it's a sort of perfect temple. And it's up on a hill. Uh, British Worthies are pretty worthy chaps, uh, including that... Um, including um, the men of letters and men of uh, valour. Uh, the men of valour includes Queen Elizabeth. Um, but they only qualify for a bust rather than a full-size statue, and they decorate uh, a, a, a little exedro as if it is from an Italian garden rather than, than um, being within a temple. But what I said I was wanting to talk about really is the restoration of the Temple of Concord um, and how an approach um, I tries to get that, you know, obviously possibly got it wrong in places, etc. But there's a desperate try and make sure that everything is as authentic as it possibly can. The history of the Temple of Concord, seen in this Medlin view of the, I think it's 90, 1797. Um, I'll come to. But um, why it needed repair was that in 1920, 1927, the new Stowe School decided it required a chapel. And they commissioned an architect, Sir Robert Blomfield, who'd just been designing Regent Street, uh, recasting Regent Street in that monumental Edwardian way, uh, to choose the site. And in, again in this vast garden, he managed to choose a site which was already occupied by the um, by a temple um, uh, by Vanborough. So the temple by Vanborough was demolished and that was taken down and they had a site for their new chapel. They then appointed another architect and the school's very fond of having knights as its architects as they feel that's rather smart. Uh, and so they chose Robert um, Sir Robert Lorimer and Lorimer had the very <coughs> bright idea that he could build a chapel on that, that position but he could also save money by removing the columns from the Temple of Concord um, and using them inside the building in rather li in the literate way without any, any um, entablature of, above them. So the columns were all removed from Concord except the two at the, the west end and, 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 and the ones actually at the east end overlooking the Grecian Valley. And um, the chapel was built in 1929 and the walls were walled up with uh, flattened brickwork um, from London Brickworks. Um, and the building stayed like that. It was used by the core. Um, there was ideas of converting it into the headmaster's house in 1951. Um, and that was the scale of the building you get by realizing that the headmaster was going to have his ground floor at this level and then there was going to be three rows of neo-Georgian windows uh, in the height of the flattened brickwork. And to make use of the great portico at the far end, um, that was to be glazed in um, as a triple height living room. Um, fortunately, that didn't happen. Unfortunately, a neo-Georgian villa was built in the Western Garden, which is the early garden. Um, but to the Grecian van, the temple. 
The building was built, as I say, as the Grecian temple. It started in 1747, and um, it is roofed in, um, uh, in, in, the, in the first image from, from those Bickham guides is, is, is this one on the left. Um, and you see it roofed with black glazed pan tiles like you see on farmhouses in Norfolk. Um, uh, but there have been quite a craze for archaeology has revealed quite a craze for using uh, black glazed pan tiles in the 1740s at Stoke, um, and we found that they were in use on, on several of the monuments built by Gibbs. Um, in um, 17, uh, the building was then developed and typical of, of um, amateur architects, and we aren't sure who the architect of this building is. Capability Brown was there as clerk of works. Um, Lord Temple it, uh, is, is shown with him holding a plan of it in one of the portraits, and, and he obviously had tremendous influence on it. But in 1753, he remodels the building um, just after it had been completed um, and introduces Lakeland Green slates, um, which are just become uh, the smartest um, slate you, you find, just being distributed because of the canal systems. And, he, and I think the reason for that, of replacing the black glazed pan tiles, is because of the introduction of the uh, Van Noss statues that are taken down from the parterre, those are the gilded statues I referred to earlier, and erected on this building. And so there's a, there's a remodeling of that. Uh, the uh, wall in front, it, do, it doesn't show on this drawing, um, the wall at this end was taken down and set back to form Pronaos, and the windows just after the, this other Bickham engraving um, were blocked up because who had ever seen a temple with windows in it? So there's a seeking to produce a really pure classical building. Um, so by, a few years later in 1763, further changes occurred. Uh, the Palladian Bridge uh, by Gibbs originally had uh, a, a bas relief sculpture in this area as you walked across because they didn't have control of the land to the east of the bridge. Um, they did have it um, by 1763, and so when the Temple of Concord was enriched to celebrate the end of the Seven Years' War, uh, they took down the um, Shoemaker's um, relief of the um, four quarters of the world bringing their products to Britannia, uh, who we see in our drawing here at the centre, and um, William Stevens, I think he's called, of, of um, uh, London, uh, recarves the relief so that it can become a tympanum sculpture and be refitted at the Temple of Concord over the main portico. And when you go in behind the, the sculpture, it's really interesting in that um, a lot of the back of the stone is plain dressed, dressed stonework because it was the back of the original bridge, it was overlooking the neighboring land. Um, and then other bits have, have palm trees and so forth on it because um, it hadn't, those hadn't been able to be accommodated in the recasting of the sculpture in 1763, so the block had been twiddled round and provided the stone because materials were very expensive in the 18th century, labor was cheap, um, and so they'd reused it, but you get these fragments of sculpture on the back of it, and then these, these ends with these sort of tortoise and turtles and so forth um, are introduced um, and the backsides of those, because they were just going to be onto a roof void, um, are just rough hewn stone. At the same time, they introduced a series of um, medallions by James Lovell, com uh, com commemorating um, civic and, and uh, uh, other types of concord. Um, and I'm sorry about the scaffold pole at the time. Um, and, the, and, and, and they also, within the building, they commemorate the seven years, uh, the, the victories of the Seven Years' War. So again, there's a remodeling of the building uh, at that time. Um, and, it was, and, and it comes down to us um, at the beginning of the 20th century. 
uh, with a few alterations in the 19th century, but they had been removed. It was made into um, a theater, um, but only the um, a, a one plinth step remained inside. Um, all the statues were still there, um, but they were sold in the 1921 sale, and except for the one at the apex, and in 1947 the Country Life photograph shows it uh, uh, in the occupation of the school. Um, photography also shows the rate of deterioration of the fabric over the years. Um, the black and white photograph is, is part of that 1947 Country Life series. Uh, the other one is uh, late 1980s, um, 89, 90. Um, and the state of the building. So the very first thing to do when the National Trust took over the garden buildings um, was, to start, was to ensure that we didn't have any more losses. So splints were introduced on the plaster across, across here to, to save the original material. Um, stainless steel bars were introduced behind these panels so that you could have little rods coming down into resin pockets in the back of them because the historic fabric is essential to maintain. We don't want to take down the fabric, we want to repair it and to not lose um, any. And, 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 and then, um, so that we could decide what to do with the building, um, a series of enabling works were carried out. Um, this shows the um, a, a initial trial cleaning um, going on um, and so what I'm advocating is a preliminary series of works. And this is the trial cleaning, which then revealed that huge sections of the stone were actual lumps of concrete, all these, these lumps, and also that the, the stone, um, if you left it undisturbed, um, was still fine and if, if it could be grouted. But if you tried to remove a block like that, all of these cracks and fractures through it, it would just fall into smithereens. And so the cleaning was terribly important to establish a methodology about how one was going to approach that. And obviously we were taking out the concrete, but we were trying to keep the stonework in, maintained as, as, as close as we can. Um, there was structural movement in the building, and some emergency works were needed in the vault, um, which forms the, the, this plinth that the floor of the temple is up at this level and this is down under here. And what was very interesting was that when you walked around in the vault space, um, you had to break the floor up to be able to get into it. You had to take up some paving slabs and then form the hole down to get into the vault. But what was really amazing was that you found underneath the holes that they last blocked up in the 18th century, were little piles of rubble that they'd swept up in the 18th century and then pushed down this hole mm. and tied it up. And they included sort of clay pipes and, and uh, fragments of building material as well as just in general debris. Um, and um, we also carried out, um, I don't think that's gone, hold on, might just come back one back. Um, Right, we, we also carried out uh, uh, other enabling things that what one found is that this is a very gentle archaeological dig going on beside the building. Um, but what's amazing is, is that every single building we've looked at, we've found that the ground levels have risen over the time, whether it's here or at Somerset House where we've been working or wherever. And the ground level should be, this is establishing the original ground level, which was down here. Um, and it had risen about um, one foot six, five, well, 500 millimeters up to this level. And in some cases, had actually come up to the molding of the skirting. So that the rising of, of the ground levels around buildings completely distorts their appearance. And people have come along and said, gosh, it's a bit soggy around the temple, and send down a load of gravel. And gradually, the ground comes up and up and up, and it distorts, right? It distorts the effect of the building, and um, you lose, lose um, the quality of the design. So re with, working with an archaeologist and re-establishing ground levels is always 
absolutely clear. And it's always very exciting that you, you work down through the, the ground and then you find the 18th century level of, of, of the gravel. Uh, with the stonework, uh, this is the site on the other side is, is trying out various consolidants and, and um, because the stone was in such a state that it either had to be consolidated or replaced and we preferred to try and find what we could work with in terms of consolidants on, on badly uh, damaged blocks. <coughs> and, and then oh, sorry, right. and, and then we all come to the work of the archaeologist who's absolutely crucial in all of these projects. And what we had was from, from the um, Huntington accounts uh, we knew that there was an edicule at the end of this building uh, in, 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 in this location and by means of raking light you could actually see where the plaster had, it had been, re we had accounts for it being removed in the, um, I think 1845 um, and um, the plaster, uh, analyzing the plasters either side of where, uh, first of all you shone raking lights up the wall and that showed the join in the plasters and then you could investigate the two different plasters, establish the different mixes, and the archaeologist sort of removed some. And to our delight, we found some pencil inscriptions on the wall of marking out for the lining out of this edicule, the pedimented edicule that was at the end of this building. Um, archaeologists, however, are destructive animals, and uh, it's not long, but having found one, one pencil line and established that the plaster is of different periods um, and a, a part of this what we'd already deemed a rather insignificant alteration to the building um, they um, the archaeologist um, removed more plaster and we found all of these setting out lines which, which from which you could uh, deduce exactly how that pediment had, had been formed and reintroducing the edicule made sense of the, um, these plaques, um, which of course should never have been painted as if they were looking like a bit of Wedgwood, and, and this inscription tablet. Um, so archaeological um, investigations were proceeding, um, and then we brought together um, a, a, an analysis of fabric, which um, was the way we approached things before we all invented how to um, bring conservation plans from Australia to this country. Um, and what we did was we, uh, for each of these temples, we um, did an ana a tabular analysis which uh, worked through every piece of the building. Um, did a, in the first column is an invent inventory description. The next is the historical accounts that relate to it why we believe the, what the, the significance of it is and what we're going to do to it. And so that you could actually coordinate uh, one's approach to all those, all those elements. And um, my colleague Stephen G. from that then produced uh, this drawing of, of the building uh, and how we thought, um, I mean, of the evidence that we had of how it was originally complete, with this edicule and so forth. Um, we then uh, started to, ha to, to work out how to, how to implement it. The stone, you, the stone needed to be the closest geological match. The, the, the original was no longer available. The quarries were totally worked out. Um, and with um, geologists, we examined other quarries so that you could match up. And it's very exciting going from um, what is called rock in these two slides to stone which is when it becomes dressed. Um, and this is the Dalton Quarry in, in, um, in um, down, down near Wells, uh, where, which was the closest match we could come to ge geologically for the stone. And so you cut it out of the, the rock face, you get it into two um, lumps, and, and then um, it, the, the stones for the columns, for reinstating the columns are, are turned on, a lathe um, 
uh, in, in the blocks of the original size. And the beauty of having the columns all in the chapel was that we could actually copy the various degree, the, the heights of the blocks and the various capitals. And then they, are, they were erected um, th up through the scaffold. Uh, but because the building had an imprint on the floor of where each column was and also on the, the base of the entablature, um, that, that had to match in with that. And of course, neither of those two aligned. Mm -hmm. So you had to very carefully adjust the column uh, when it was being constructed. And then to get the fluting working, the basic fluting, as I say, had been worked out in the factory, and then you paired it in by hand to get the fluting running through um, down the columns. Um, the capitals um, were copied from the, from, um, by taking plaster casts and then carving in the workshop from um, the ones in the chapel. Um, each one had a different fleur on, um, these, these, these flowers, and, um, and what Stephen did was to um, look at the erosion on the, on, on the um, of, of, of all the um, capitals in the chapel and you could deduce that the most eroded ones would have been set at the west, southwest corner of the building where the prevailing wind was. Um, uh, supervising the carving of the capitals upside down was a novel experience um, and, but we got them done and then, and then they would be set in the building and completed. Um, uh, in situ. Um, on the capitals that we still had, um, some had lost their volutes, and so this is a bit, piece of stone uh, placed in and then carved in, sit, carved in situ. Others had, um, had volute fatigue because all the amount of carving around here and the undercutting meant that capitals often cut off, off here. They, they fail and collapse there. And so what we did with the, with the stone that still survived and was still hanging in, we pinned it with stainless steel pins and then pieced in missing sections like that. And they, the, the, the sculptors did that absolutely beautifully, uh, again, with minimal loss of the original material. Um, above the columns, the entablature was plaster. Analysis could show, uh, w w I mean, we had blatant losses but um, this, these were all 18th century plasters. Uh, further around, we had rather bad late 19th century copies, um, and we um, consolidated the 18th century cast um, elements. Uh, you run the mouldings through, and then all the leaves are cast as separate things in gypsum plaster and, and stuck on. Um, the same with the renders on the wall of the cellar, because they'd been within the brick top areas, um, they had survived remarkably well. It, was re it seemed really important that you should still re retain the original renders, and so we consolidated them and filled in lacunae. Um, with the uh, portico, um, we, we, we had the um, Statue of Victory, um, um, which was still at Stowe, lying in the uh, a state yard. Um, the other statues had been um, had gone to Lord Fairhaven's garden at Anglesey Abbey, um, and we were able to get casts of those through the through because of the National Trust ownership. Um, and th so they um, went up and rejoined the shoemakers, re remodelled um, tympanum. Um, and then all of this work was also very much informed by paint analysis. Um, the doors of the temple um, were revealed by paint scraping, which we see in this slide, um, to have been grained mahogany. Um, but the um, uh, Mr. Lat Latapi visits in the 1770s and describes Prussian blue and gold doors on the temple. And uh, but that, that, that didn't appear by, by doing any of these paint scrapes and, and, and layering. Um, what, where, where one finds that is by doing proper paint microscopy, and you take a very little sample about the size of a fingernail of paint uh, with just a sliver of the background material, 
uh, put it in a polythene envelope, get back to the studio, um, set it in a sort of resin ice cube, and then look at it under the microscope, and then you saw it in half. That reveals the edge of the, of the paint, and you look under the microscope, and here's all the, the um, browns that we discovered by, by paint scrapes. Um, and behind that is the gilding and the um, uh, Prussian blue. And so this shows that the whole of the doors were painted Prussian blue, which is a very expensive uh, pigment that had only just been recently discovered, well, discovered in the uh, 40 years before, actually. Um, they, they painted the whole of the doors Prussian blue and then overlaid certain mouldings with, with the gilding. And um, you then repainted the doors. Um, terrible problems with taste in that when we were painting the doors and when we were doing the gilding, um, everybody who knew about gilding said we've got it in the wrong location. But evidence showed where it should go. And we were wavering, but Catherine Hattel, who is the paint analyst we work with, she said, stick to your guns. We got the evidence of where it was. And, um, and we managed to persuade the National Trust to do it exactly how it should be in, the, in those locations. And why everybody was wavering on that is that when you go to a house like Hokum, a great William Kent house, which you'd think of as Kent and Temporary, um, all those buildings are re-gilded in the 1840s and much enriched. And therefore, one's perception of 18th century gilding is through 18th century properties like that. And, it's, and, and you know, it comes as a bit of a surprise that, that things like the sort of leaves at the corner should be blue and there's a reversal of certain things on these doors. But when they were finished, I think that was, it, it looked pretty good. Um, paint analysis also sh revealed that the whole of the building was lime washed. And the 18th century accounts t keep telling us about Israel, Israel someone, um, uh, going around the garden, washing, lime washing the buildings and the statues. You know, whenever he's got this, this laborer, whenever he's got the odd day with nothing to do, he goes and lime washes in other buildings. And all of the garden buildings at Stowe were lime washed, and the house was as well. It wasn't a romantic, decaying stone world. It was, it was this marvelous um, uh, lime wash, so it still lets you read the stone, etc. Um, and elsewhere, I mean, one invariably finds the, 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 the 18th century garden monuments and houses were lime washed uh, at other sites. Uh, it also gave us the inscription, um, sorry, signs back to front, of, of, so of, 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 on the uh, pulverinated frieze, um, and that that was in uh, gilding over a, a red ground. Uh, but what was important in the restoration of the building, the restoration of the building is a cinch. I mean, what is really important is the coordination of the building and the restoration of the landscape. That what had happened over the years was that the landscape had completely changed with um, trees growing up and dividing the garden into a series of hermetic areas, which and denying all the vistas that had been intended in the 18th century <coughs> and had totally, totally altered the form of the place. Um, there was a landscape committee uh, with people like Christopher Hussey and Ray Fernie on it in the 19, uh, from the 1950s, and they did tremendous work, but nearly all their planting that went in in, the, in that period uh, was inappropriate when we started actually coordinating the the um, landscape with the um, uh, original I I accounts and information. Uh, this area was intended by Capability Brown, uh, and we have all the accounts from wheeling and burying the earth, uh, was intended to be a lake, but um, it never worked and it never was. Um, and Nat's view shows the Arcadian landscape uh, with sheep grazing in, in this area and, and the importance of monuments in the Grecian Valley. Um, and so bringing back the landscape, um, 
was, was, has been tremendously important and, and one wants to think of the restoration not as a restoration of a building but the restoration of a character area. Um, we've got the building repaired, um, the, the, a path that the school had introduced down here joining the rugger field back to the mansion has been removed and archaeological digs have revealed um, the, lo the location of the path that went round both sides of the valley, so that you walked along and looked down into this Arcadian landscape. It's also revealed the foundations of the statues that populated the valley, and, and uh, because we know their locations and we know the whereabouts of the present ones, we, they can all gradually go back and start completing this, this thing. Um, from, when you look out from the temple, the um, ladies' diagonal to to the Lord Cobham's pillar has been opened up and last week we put back a statue, an 11 foot high statue of Lord Cobham on top of that column. Um, so it's the restoration of character areas and it's the restoration of a place rather than just the buildings and the, exactly the same sort of uh, research can support the, research, the restoration of the gardens and the introduction of, of the planting into those gardens will ch change it to gardens again and to differentiate it from the outlying park. And the problem with Stowe has been that the park has become farmland over the, year, over the years and we're now restoring the park with an HLF grant uh, to parkland and the gardens, when they get that sort of Mark Laird treatment, um, they then become gardens again, but on an absolutely vast scale. Um, in 1770, um, Thomas Watley wrote in Observations of Modern, of, of Modern Gardens that the Temple of Concord at Stowe has been mentioned as one of the noblest objects that ever adorned a garden. But there is a moment when it appears in singular beauty. The setting sun shines on the long colonnade which faces west. All the lower parts of the building are darkened by the neighboring wood. The pillars rise at different heights out of this obscurity. Some of them are, are nearly overspread with it. Some are checkered with a variety of tints and others are illuminated down almost to their bases. The light is gently softened off by the rotundity of the columns but it spreads in broad gleams upon the walls within them. Such an occasional effect, however transient, is so exquisitely beautiful that it would be unpardonable to neglect it. I think he got it right. Thank you very much. What has been so gratifying about this from our point of view is that you should have all come to participate in this weekend. Somebody, however, has got rather tired. <laughs> uh, has it, from your point of view, been worthwhile, do you think? Good, good, good because we do see this as an important function that the Architectural Association's course can carry on, where we identify themes that really do need discussion and can benefit from being broadcast to a wide audience such as yourselves. And therefore, we feel that we will continue to hold conferences of this sort if that appears to be a useful function. And I can see one or two nods, which is always encouraging, and so it would be ludicrous and silly to attempt to sum up what has been so diverse a series of lectures. There's no point in that, I think. But I do think we will promise to you that if this has been a success, and we believe it has, 
that something of this nature will be repeated in the years coming. So finally, on behalf of all of us at the Architectural Association, thank you. But I would like to give one special vote of thanks, and that is to Rosemary Jury, who has been the person who has supported the whole of the organization of this conference and carried the brunt of it all. So can we please give her a thank you. Come again. Bye-bye.